Gunning for Google again, the government puts the antitrust spotlight on the search engine giant for the second time in as many years. I'm Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg West. Coming up, lines as always for the latest iPhones, but will Apple be able to ring up another sales record? Former Apple retail chief Ron Johnson joins us. Plus, BlackBerry confirms it's making an Android phone. CEO John Chen tells me the worst for the company is over. Plus, Presidents Obama and Xi present a united front on climate change, at least. The UN's top climate chief tells us what the deal means for the big talks ahead in Paris. First to our lead. For the second time in two years, Google is in the U.S. government's crosshairs. According to people familiar with the investigation, the Federal Trade Commission is looking into whether Google restricted competitors' access to Android. Just last month, I asked FTC Commissioner Terrell McSweeney whether the agency would be taking another look at the company following the search engine investigation. Take a listen to what she had to say. That case was closed before I joined the commission, um, so I wasn't part of that decision-making process. But I think it would be highly unusual for the commission to uh, go back and reopen a case. So to be clear, I was asking about a different investigation, but I said, should the U.S. government take another look at Google? Joining me now from Washington, Sarah Ford and Bloomberg's team leader for financial crimes and enforcement coverage. So Sarah, what do you make of uh, the commissioner's comments there? Does this new potential investigation signify a change in attitude by the government towards Google? Well, certainly it was a surprise to everyone to learn that the FTC is taking another look at Google two years after closing their previous investigation. However, this time we're hearing that they're focusing on the Android platform and whether Google's uh, properties on that platform are restricting or excluding other services that people might want to have. Now, to be fair, this is very early stages. They've sat down and spoken with a few tech companies. Uh, we don't have a clear sense of how much uh, resources, how much energy they're going to put into this. So it's, it's not clear yet whether it's going to be going to have legs. How much do you think Europe's hard look at Google, Europe's own investigations are swaying uh, the behavior by the FTC? Well, clearly Europe is way out in front of the FTC. They have been sending out questionnaires to companies. They are already starting to look and study at those those responses. So uh, one thought is that the FTC didn't want to be out of the loop on this and felt that it needed to have its own uh, way of looking at what's going on um, with Google. But that's that's really just a theory. We don't we don't have a lot of more information at this stage about what they're thinking. You know, there was an interesting op-ed in the New York Times by Robert Reich saying that no government agency is keeping a big enough eye on the U.S. companies, U.S. tech companies in particular. Sarah, is that something that you would agree with? Well, these, uh, you know, we love our monopolies. We love our big tech companies. In, in the U.S., it's not illegal to be a monopoly, whereas it's much trickier in Europe. Um, but at the same time, uh, the signs that, that you know, the, the FTC is going back to this uh, does indicate that, that maybe things need to be looked at more closely. Um, their sort of partner, sister agency, the Justice Department, has already said they were not going to take up uh, looking at Google after the FTC closed their last case. So it really is in the FTC's hands if they're going to do anything. All right. Our Bloomberg News reporter, Sarah Forden, I know you're going to keep us updated on this story. Thanks so much for checking in. Thank you. Now, turning now to the other giant in Silicon Valley, that is Apple. iPhone devotees diligently lined up at stores around the world to get their hands on the latest models, the 6S and the 6S Plus. CEO Tim Cook even tweeted out this pic of the first customer to buy the phone in the world in the store in Australia. But will 3D Touch, a better camera, a new rose gold color, help Apple have another record-setting weekend? Joining me now from Santa Barbara, California, Ron Johnson, CEO of Enjoy and former head of retail for Apple. And with us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Mark Gurman, senior editor of 9to5Mac.com. Breaking a lot of Apple stories these days, Mark is. Uh, and guys, I actually have my new iPhone 6S in rose gold, which anecdotally seems to be the most popular color. Uh, at least 35% of people in line, according to one analyst, were waiting for the rose gold color. It's, it's pink, 
but it's a nice shade of pink. Um, so, Ron, I, I just want to start with you. You conceived Apple retail stores. Just give us an idea of what's going on behind the scenes at Apple today, given that this uh, it, it's not a huge design change in, in terms of the new phone, but but there's a but there's a but there are a number of important updates here. Yeah, it's an extremely exciting day for everyone at Apple, especially in the stores. It's their chance to shine. And I had the blessing of being a part of many, you know, iPhone launches and other launches at Apple. And the team's ready, and I'm sure they're delivering fabulously. And I think this is going to be another great iPhone. You know, sometimes in the odd years where there isn't a big change on the industrial design, some of the most important things happen on the inside of the phone. And I believe both 3D touch and 4K video will be game changers. So, Mark, do you think these updates are big enough for Apple to have another record-setting weekend? Absolutely. If you look at previous S model updates like the 3GS, 4S, and 5S, the 6S in comparison has tons of new features in terms of just adding numbers. Like Ron said, I think 4K video recording, that 12 megapixel camera that that comes with, and the new 3D touch screen will be huge drivers of sales that people want to come to stores and grab. So. Uh, Ron, you know, it's interesting. We're back to the lines with the phones. With the watch, they tried something different where you made an appointment and you got your watch by reservation. Does it make sense to you to have these two different kinds of strategies for two different kinds of products? And what do you think of the way Angela Ahrens, the current head of Apple Retail, how do you think she's handling things so far? Oh, I think Angela is doing a fabulous job. You know, I still talk to the teams at Apple and they respect her, they admire her, they believe in her leadership. She's doing a great job. Every launch requires a slightly different strategy, and that's because of the nature of the challenge of the supply chain to deliver it. In this case, Apple now has nine years of launching iPhones. They've got enough quantity that they can have both an ability for someone to reserve a reservation to get an iPhone, but just to show up like you might have done and get a rose gold phone on day one. And so I think every launch will be a little different, but Angela and the team are you know, doing a great job you know, carrying the torch for Apple. So this is the first time they've released the phones worldwide at the same time. Uh, you know, with the last launch, they held some phones back in China. So anecdotally, we're hearing that lines are shorter, but some analysts are saying that's because you don't got those people in line trying to get a bunch of phones to sell on the black market in other countries. Mark, what do you think is going on with the supply chain? The fact that they've been able to release these phones globally, what does that say about how they got here? Well, I think like Ron said, they've sort of perfected the supply chain management and output of iPhones at this point after releasing new models every year since 2007. And I think if you look at just the ship times and anecdotal evidence, they're doing a much better job this year at you know, having enough supply for demand, particularly on the iPhone 6. The 6S Plus is still shipping in three to four weeks from Apple's website and into late October from some of the U.S. carrier sites. But the iPhone 6 is almost readily available. I know a family member actually ordered a 6S from Verizon's website yesterday, and it's being delivered today. And that's pretty quick and not something that you would have seen in the last few years. Now, Ron, you know better than anybody what the real story is with Apple's supply chain, but uh, there's always been this suspicion that Apple holds back supply to create demand and create this sort of frenzy around these new product launches. Is that true? Uh, I don't believe it's true. Apple makes as many as they can with the focus on delivering the quality they need to. And it's just been the case for the past few years that demand has far outstripped their ability to supply. Um, but the goal is always to get as many of the new products into customers' hands as quickly as possible. So, Mark, you know, it's interesting. I think Apple certainly doesn't want to seem like a luxury company, but you do see them adding more luxury accessories to the products with the Hermes bands for the watches. You know, what do you make of that evolution at Apple? I think they want to appeal to everyone. They certainly want to appeal to the high end, but they also want to be in reach. And I think something very important about this year's iPhone launch is that they've actually reduced the prices of the older iPhone 6 and 6 Plus from 2014 by a hundred dollars a piece and I think that's going to spur a lot of sales of those phones which are still very popular in many parts of the world so I think the Herme bands on the watch plus these discounts on still great phones shows that Apple wants to appeal to everyone and have a product for everyone so Ron for you two questions first would you agree with that and second at Enjoy uh, you are creating this sort of white glove experience for the delivery of 
electronics, including for iPhones. Uh, tell us how that works. Yeah, well, at Enjoy, it's really easy. With the iPhone, you just go to AT&T's website, order a phone online, and pick free hand delivery. And we can then hand deliver and help you set up the phone and teach you how to use it in as fast as four hours. So if someone went to the AT&T.com site right now, they could have delivery tonight in New York or San Francisco where we're operating, uh, which we think is a really breakthrough in how to buy a new product. Is Apple a luxury company, Ron? Apple's a company for everybody. And when you think of things we wear and the watch is a wearable, there's always been ranges of products that people like to do. It's like Apple's trying to be a company for all people, and so you can get a sport band for more casual, it's lower priced, or you can get a more luxury brand at the same time. So I think Apple's a premier brand that serves a luxury customer and an everyday customer, and they have to develop merchandise strategies for all. All right, Ron Johnson, former head of Apple Retail, now CEO of Enjoy. Mark Gurman, senior editor at 9to5Mac. Thank you both. I'm going to be trying out my new rose gold phone this weekend. I haven't gotten a lot of time to play with it, but I'm very excited. Coming up, BlackBerry seeks a lifeline from Google. CEO John Chen tells us why his next phone won't run on BlackBerry's own operating system. BlackBerry takes a beating. Shares slump today after the company posted a wider than expected loss and smartphone shipments hit their lowest level in eight years. But CEO John Chen says the worst is over. He's betting that consumers will come back for the Priv phone, a handset that runs on Android's operating system. I asked him why he's now working with Google. The thing that has always hurt us is lack of an application ecosystem support. So in working with Google and being able to, to put our BlackBerry uh, know-how uh, into the latest operating system there um, you know, should, should, should appeal to a lot of people, especially professionals and more high-end consumer. If your high security customers embrace uh, the Android phone, would you be convinced to stop selling, you know, the BlackBerry operating system phones? What would it take to do that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, so, first off, the BlackBerry 10 phone is still the most secure phone um, in the market. Uh, we have a lot of very high-end government users on that. Um, we pledge to continue support of that. Uh, we actually have a new releases coming out. Um, in March of next year, um, a software release that provide yet another level of security certification. So, so the, 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 go the government and the very um, regulated industry customers will be taken care of. Now, um, we will continue to develop uh, security for the Android space, um, and there will be a time that the customer will say, okay, well, that's that I could accept or that I could certify, then we'll switch them over. Um, but there is no particular timeline um, because we're comfortable on supporting the software updates on, on BlackBerry 10. Now, John, we have to talk about revenue because you said it wouldn't fall below $500 million and this quarter it came up short. How much lower can it go or, or is this bottom? When does it ramp back up? I made a statement today in the earnings call that I expect Q3 to uptake from the Q2 volume and Q4 to uptick from Q3. So uh, you, could, you could call it a bottom, you could call it whatever, um, but that's what we expect to do. So we, st we should see some uptick uh, in the next two quarters. You know, you're, you, John, you're really bullish about the potential for BlackBerry software, BlackBerry in cars. And, and I want to talk to you about this because, you know, we saw with Volkswagen this week using software to deliberately cheat emission standards. Apple is reportedly pushing ahead on its own car. What role do you see for BlackBerry in cars going forward? Car is a big, car is a really big market um, because it's really about IoT, I mean, the Internet of Things. Car is kind of the first frontier of that. Um, it interacts with your phones and interacts with your, your, your home Wi-Fi. Um, and so, and it obviously 
do anything from telematics to you know advanced driver assist to safety to to controls and you know um, uh, entertainment systems and so forth. So car is kind of all com you know think about it as being a really big application uh, itself. So a lot of people could make um, a lot of good business out of, of the uh, connected car. We of course provide a lot of the basic operating systems environment into a car, um, Ford and Volkswagen, to, you know, to name a few. We have about 250 brands around the world. Uh, so um, we think we get there's a good business there. We already do quite a bit of business there. So how many cars does BlackBerry touch now and what's the goal? 60 million is what the last count was. Six zero um, in, on the road running around today. Um, well, I mean, there is really no upper limit to the goal. Um, you know, car also is a replaceable item, and, and then we will get from cars to other things like truck tracking and you know uh, medical devices and access management. So uh, it's a it's a why it, it's a pretty big space. Uh, even if it's just focus on transportation, is a big space. BlackBerry CEO John Chen there. You can watch the full interview online at Bloomberg.com. Now, to Chinese President Xi Jinping's visit to Washington, D.C., tensions have been high between the two countries over cybersecurity. President Obama and President Xi held private meetings this morning before a joint press conference. Take a listen to what President Obama had to say about an agreement Good reached on cybercrime. Today, I can announce that our two countries have reached a common understanding on the way forward. We've agreed that neither the U.S. or the Chinese government will conduct or knowingly support cyber-enabled theft of intellectual property, including trade secrets or other confidential business information for commercial advantage. In addition, we'll work together and with other nations to promote international rules of the road for appropriate conduct in cyberspace. Coming up, the U.N. climate chief joins us as Presidents Obama and Xi renew their pledge to tackle emissions. We'll talk about the role of tech in these goals next. Time now for the Daily Bite, one number that tells a bigger story. Today's number is 316 million. That's how many monthly active users Twitter has, but the company would like a lot more than that, and with good reason. Earlier this week, I told you how Instagram surged past Twitter with 400 million monthly users. Well, now Twitter is adding some new features, including a tool that lets users create polls and track results. Twitter CFO Anthony Noto started tweeting some embedded polls yesterday, including one that asked, boxers or briefs? At last check, boxers were winning two to one. It's Friday. That's why that story's okay. Tension over cyber attacks aside, Presidents Obama and Xi Jinping presented a united front on a separate topic today, climate change. The leaders of the world's two top economies reaffirmed their commitment to cutting carbon emissions and pledged billions to help poor countries do the same. Also today, Pope Francis warned world leaders at the U.N. General Assembly to do more than make, quote, solemn promises about the environment. All of this as negotiators try to hammer out a landmark agreement among nearly 200 nations to rein in pollution-causing emissions. Joining me now from New York to discuss these goals is U.N. Climate Chief Christiana Figueres. Uh, Christiana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank First you question, invite. you know. Thanks. Thank you. It's great to have you. How important would you say is this announcement from President Obama and President Xi as an example to other nations ahead of these talks in Paris? It is critically important. There is no doubt that these are the two greatest economies. Uh, they're also the two greatest polluters. So for them to take action and to do it together is really very, very important because A, it proves that they are assuming certainly the United States has past responsibility. China is looking into the future and they're assuming their responsibility together. But it also is a very, very important example of how by not just working individually and separately, but rather by joining forces and joining efforts, everyone can do so much more than we're doing right now. So for, on both accounts, a very, very important role modeling for the world. You know, state leaders are one thing. Mark Zuckerberg is another. Zuckerberg's actually going to be speaking at the UN over the weekend about sustainability. How important are our business leaders like Mark Zuckerberg? 
critically important. It's absolutely clear uh, that policy is critical and it has to be the bedrock of change and that is what every single country is doing now individually within their own borders as well as contributing to the construction of the international regulatory framework that is going to guide this transformation over the next 10 to 20 years but that that is not the end of the story that policy then needs to be enacted that policy then needs to be taken to the ground to make really the difference on the ground and that is the purview of the private sector. It's also the responsibility of subnational governments. So there is a very important collaborative um, framework that is being built here between national governments on one side, establishing the policy, and then those that are implementing and actually getting the work done, which are the subnational governments and corporations and civil society. You know, we talk a lot about clean energy on this show. You know, we've, we've talked about innovations in solar and wind. Where do you see the most promise? Well, it is definitely in, in the family of uh, renewables and really quite amazing what we see happening right in front of, uh, in front of our eyes. Uh, so it is being reported, although we will wait a few days to have the confirmation, that India will be, uh, by 2030, they will be generating 350 gigawatts of renewable energy. That is the equivalent of 175 Hoover dams. China, on the other hand, now has all what we know and have confirmed is that China installed last year four times as much wind power as the United States, and that by 2030, China will actually have a thousand gigawatts, which is the exact same as the United States total generation capacity now. So you see that developing countries are truly taking the lead in investing in renewable energy because they have understood that that is where their future is. That makes sense for them. And quickly, Christina, we talk about uh, nuclear energy on the show. I recently spoke with the CEO of an innovative nuclear startup called Transatomic Power. How important or critical do you think nuclear energy c could be to this cause, or, or is that still a long way off? We only have about 30 seconds. I think that's a question that every country is going to have to decide for themselves. But on nuclear, I think at least three factors have to be considered. First, safety, certainly. Secondly, increasing costs because of added security measures as compared to decreasing costs in renewables. And finally, the dependence All on right. extending the grid. Christiana Figueres, UN Climate Chief, thank you so much for joining us. Very important to hear your thoughts ahead of Paris. Uh, and that does it for this edition of the show. Have a wonderful weekend. We're back on Monday.